In this year's German elections, the Greens are playing with the big boys. It's been quite a campaign for the party. They spent months as number two in the polls, giving quite a scare to traditional leading parties on the center-right and center-left. That seemed to justify the bold step they took this time around, to put forward a green candidate for chancellor, something they'd never done before. That candidate is Annalena Baerbock. The rules had to be changed to make room for her in the TV debates. Until now, there'd only ever been two candidates. Omens of success were there for those who looked for them. For a while, it seemed possible that Baerbock could succeed Angela Merkel as chancellor. Und so beginnt heute ein neues Kapitel für unsere Partei. Und wenn wir es gut machen, auch für unser Land. Wir haben eine klare Idee einer Kanzlerschaft für Deutschland. Such an idea shows how far the Greens have come. Some still think they bear traces of their radical anti-establishment early days. For others, the Greens are the Verbotspartei, the party of bans. A party that wants to stop everyone eating meat and driving combustion engine cars. Bourgeois and urban and out of touch with real life. But the party has moved away from its anti-establishment radicalism and is trying to reframe its nagging woke reputation. And although it all feels new and the idea of a green chancellor is fresh, the Greens have been here, or near here, before. Those radicals didn't look like a party of government, but their demands for fundamental changes in German society and politics found an audience. Reinhard Bütikofer has been a Green Party member since the early 1980s. He became party leader in the early 2000s and is now a member of the European Parliament. We were an opposition party. We were, we called ourselves an anti-party party. We wanted to be completely different. We wanted to bring a completely different new agenda uh, to the national conversation. Uh, we, uh, we were shrill and we were loud. It wasn't just their political clothing that stood out in the traditional setting. When Joschka Fischer became the first Green to be sworn in as state minister, he wore sneakers to the ceremony. A symbol of a new generation, a new movement taking its place in the political arena. The states have been a success story for the Greens. They've gradually built up their voter base and are now part of the government in 11 of Germany's 16 states. And they didn't stop at state governments. For a party that's just four decades old, the Greens have a lot of experience under their belts. They consistently had MPs in the federal parliament. They've been there since 1983, when they first took seats in the then West German Bundestag. And 15 years later, they joined the federal government for the first time, as junior coalition partners to the Social Democrats. Joschka Fischer swapped his sneakers for some more formal shoes and stepped into the prestigious role of foreign minister. Their time in government made the Greens seem more like a serious political party. There were some victories. The part green government introduced a policy to phase out nuclear power, but they also had to manage the realities of being in charge, including some difficult decisions. Perhaps the one that stirred up the most conflict within the party was one that challenged the deeply held pacifism of many Greens. Germany decided, with Fischer as foreign minister, to support NATO's 1999 bombing of Serbia during the Kosovo War. Jürgen Trittin was the Green Environment Minister at the time. He was next to Fischer at the tumultuous meeting when the party voted on the Kosovo decision. This was a lesson, I think, for a lot of Greens also. It's complicated to cover. There are backlashes. But you can succeed, even in such complicated situation where you go to war that you seriously, all of us, even including Joschka, didn't want it but we failed to avoid it. Being anti-war was a founding principle of the party. Many members left, feeling their morals had been compromised. I think that was the moment when the majority of the Green Party decided that we would go down a reformist trajectory. We used to have two wings in the party, the, the so-called realo wing, 
which was more or less the pragmatist wing and, and the so-called Funni and fundamentalist wing. That's when most of the leading fundamentalists decided they were no longer going to support this project. The Greens served in two governments. They proved they could do it. And in the meantime, it seemed like society was catching up with their environmental thinking. The overarching crisis is climate change. It's really happening and is starting to hit at home. Only this summer, floods devastated communities in Central Europe, with hundreds of people killed in Western Germany. Fires raged in the Mediterranean after weeks of scorching temperatures. And while the Greens used to seem eccentric for worrying about the environment, now everyone's doing it. People are demanding that even mainstream products are more climate friendly, and industry is responding. It's easy to drive an electric car, to sign up for wind and solar-generated electricity, and even to eat a meat-free burger should you want to. This mainstreaming of green ideas and the advance of the climate crisis means that established parties campaign on such issues too. The Greens' prime policy now belongs to everyone. But some suggest this doesn't have to mean political disaster. Und äh, jetzt, wo alle anderen Parteien auf diesem Feld auch aktiv sind, auch Angebote machen, haben die Grünen natürlich die Gelegenheit, die Möglichkeit herauszustellen, dass sie schon immer auf diesem Themenfeld aktiv waren, dass sie auch immer Angebote gemacht und durchaus auch ihrer Zeit voraus waren. Und damit kann man sich natürlich von den politischen Mitbewerbern ähm, auch sehr gut abheben. While society at large has moved towards the Greens, the Greens have also taken steps to win over the average voter. There's sort of a pull and push mechanism going on between German society and the German um, Green Party. And um, one could say that today the party is um, a almost like a catch-all party. They've deliberately moved towards the political center. For example, they now embrace business as an ally in the fight against climate change and they relax their position on genetic engineering and research. This process of softening and moving to the center has been driven by the party's current leadership, and they managed to bring the party with them. The Greens elected Robert Habeck along with Annalena Baerbock as joint party leaders in January 2018. They are Greens' next generation. Habeck was in high school when Fischer became state minister in those sneakers, and Baerbock was in kindergarten, she was born the same year the party was founded, in 1980. They are focused and politically hungry. We have uns 40 years darauf vorbereitet mit allen Ecken und Kanten. Jetzt ist der Moment, unser Land zu erneuern und alles ist drin. But many, particularly young people, say they haven't been bold enough in mapping out those possibilities. Fridays for Future activists have attacked the Greens for not being strong enough on climate protection. I think it's okay, it's necessary. Without a social movement like Fridays for Future, we won't bring anything through legislation because we won't get a huge majority for that. And on the other side, without Greens in government, these movements won't get bring through anything. So this is a form of work share and part of the work is that they criticize us. We have to live with that. It is a difficult position to be in. They need broad support to get enough votes to gain office, so they can do things. But they also risk contradicting their entire founding principles if they move too far to the center. The Greens pose a significant challenge to the two main parties on a national level. A remarkable feat for a young party. But their impressive surge at the start of the campaign seemed to ebb as election day got closer. By early September, a green chancellor to replace Merkel seemed unlikely. This may have to do with the party's lack of experience. Remember, they never put forward a chancellor candidate before, always aiming to be part of government, not the lead coalition partner. And their chancellor candidate, Annalena Baerbock, is also inexperienced. She has been an MP in Germany's federal parliament for eight years, but she's never had any governing responsibility at federal or state level. And that made her vulnerable to attack. Not only that, 
allegations that Baerbock had embellished her CV and plagiarized parts of her book hit the party in the polls. Most importantly, it made people question how competent the party was that this could even happen. Hätte man doch erwartet, dass die Grünen ihre Kampagne professioneller vorbereiten und auch begleiten lassen. Also die Fehler, die wir gesehen haben in der Kampagne, insbesondere etwa die Diskussion um den Lebenslauf von Annalena Baerbock, würde man meines Erachtens, und da haben sich auch viele Politikberater zu geäußert, tatsächlich zum, zum kleinen Einmaleins des Wahlkampfs zählen und sagen, also das sind eigentlich Must-Haves in der Vorbereitung einer Wahlkampagne. These mistakes disappointed many who found the idea of a young green chancellor an exciting one. They'll likely cost the party votes on September 26. Ultimately, how Baerbock and the party do on election day will depend on whether they can convince enough voters that the sneakers and the nagging have really gone and they're competent to govern.